Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Grant. I'm part of the OpenStreetMap sysadmin team and operations working group. Uh, I've been a mapper since 2006, which is, of course, the most important thing, mappers that make the project go round. I uh, regularly map round where I live or where I go on holidays. I get involved in the humanitarian uh, mapathons, and I'm one of those strange guys that actually map addresses. Map addresses, guys, it's good. Uh, so what, what is the, the operations working group that I mentioned? We're the group that basically plan the project long term to make sure that we can do things properly and we're projecting for the growth of the project. Uh, OpenStreetMap's quite a challenge running. Uh, it's an interesting challenge. We've got a lot, lot of interesting problems to deal with. We've got, uh, as you probably heard during the conference, 2.1 million registered users, which is a phenomenal number. We've got up to 1,800 new signups a day. Uh, that's mainly because of the uh, hot events that have been happening recently, but that's a fantastic problem to deal with. Uh, 1,800 new signups a day. On average, we have around 3,000 mappers each day, which again is fantastic, 3,000 people mapping. Uh, all of this leads to a fairly large database. As, as Tom before me mentioned, we've got a database that's uh, growing fairly rapidly. In the last year, we've grown one terabyte, which is a fair bit of storage when you get to databases. Currently, our Postgres database, which is the main database for the project, is uh, 4.8 terabytes in Postgres SQL. Uh, it, it has lots of users accessing it, reading, reading from it, and updating the database. It has to always be available, or as near possible. We can't, we don't work with, uh, we don't negotiate with groups when they should map, when they shouldn't. Everyone maps all the time, 24-7. We're a 24-7 project. So then we've got all these mappers creating all this lovely data, but they want to see the data. So we, we render the map and produce, on OpenStreetMap.org, you can see this rendered map. And that in itself is quite a challenge to run. Uh, the map is updated every minute. So after you've made a change, change to OpenStreetMap, within a minute, the map is normally updated. So the colors behind there is a graph of people accessing the map rendering server. Uh, there's a little blip in the middle, which uh, is where we're actually missing some log data. It's not, not that we've had a drop off, but we've got this continual growth as the project grows. Uh, that's, that's the previous year's growth for the map rendering server. Uh, that, that server serves out 5,300 requests per second which if you're a technical person, you'll understand that's, that's quite a hard problem to deal with. Uh, that peaks at around 10,000 requests per second during the day, which in itself is, there used to be a technical problem called the 10K problem, is how do you get servers to handle these number of requests? Thankfully, it's getting a lot easier to deal with them as servers get faster and faster and soft, software gets better. But we still have to put a fair bit of work into this. Uh, Data-wise, that works out to, to 400 megabits per second, which is a lot of data, and that peaks at over double that at 480 megabits of data. So the way we, we sort of manage this is we've divided up some of the services in the project into three groups. I'm only going to mention the first two. So we, our attention as a group, as the operations working group, we put most of the focus into running what we call the primary services for the project. And obviously, we have the website, which people use to access the website, the API, where if you're a mapper, the program that you use will talk to this, this API. And then we also have the data export services, which I'll, I'll go into detail a little later. Uh, we then have secondary services that we don't consider absolutely vital to the running of the project. So we have the map rendering, which I've just discussed. Uh, we've got a search service, and we've got the wiki, where all the archive information or how, to docu how certain things are tagged and documented, they're kept on the wiki. And the reason why we don't consider these absolutely vital to the running of the project 
is because, for example, the tile, tile service, there are people that will take the raw exports and produce their own map rendering. So we have companies that do that and other groups like the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team who take the raw data and produce their own specific renderings of the map. So we divide how we, we, we run the project in the, into these two sections. Uh, we, we run as a group quite a few services. So we, we run a phenomenal number. We run help and blogs and, and we've got the foundation websites that we actually run. We've got ticket handling systems and analytics so we know what sort of people are visiting the website. And then we've also got one or two services that are, are run by other people. So the forum is actually not run by us, which is a great service to us. And we've got continuous integration servers and blogs that are also run by other people. And I, we really appreciate them running those services. So how do we do, do this all? We've got 41 servers uh, in 19 different data centers. Uh, a lot of the hardware is standardized, some of it isn't, and we're cu currently trying to standardize more of the hardware behind the, behind the project. Uh, all of our servers are named after dragons. Uh, we do that just for fun. It gives us some, <laughs> some interest when we get to name a server. We have to dig out and find a, a dragon name that's short enough to be concise for a server name and something we can actually remember. Uh, so I, I pretty like, I love servers, I work on them all day. This is our database server. It's got lots of disks so we can have lots of people accessing it at the same time. Uh, just so I didn't forget the server name, I wrote it down. That one's called Catla, which is the name of a dragon. And then we have, all our servers have different names and you can see that, that there that those are all similar looking services, servers and we've standardized on them. Those are all HP servers, which are great, great machines to have. And then in the talk before me, there was Tom talking about how we actually serve requests. So we have, we have a, a cluster of servers that answer the requests, and we have different sections. So the main cluster of servers that respond to you accessing OpenStreetMap or editing OpenStreetMap, we have six servers that respond there. And then we have another cluster of servers as the database, and then we have file story, a file storage server behind that. So we have quite a few machines that respond to the project that and, you know, have to be available, and we, we take down bits of the servers so that we can do maintenance on them or, or fix broken hardware. But uh, because we've got enough redundancy built in there, we can do things reliably and keep the website running. And we've been fairly successful in in doing these sorts of things, keeping it running. Uh, we run some tools to check on how reliable we are. We use a service called Pingdom, and we've, I think our last one was uh, four nines, which is 99.99% .99 uptime, which is, is quite something to achieve. Uh, I mentioned the database cluster, so we use Postgres SQL as our database cluster, which is uh, open source database software, which is not the coolest and hippest database out there, but it works and it's very reliable. Uh, we use a slave server of that so that we have security. If, if one server had to fail, we've got a fallback, and we keep regular backups of, of those servers so that we do care about the data and make sure that it will, will continue to be available. So earlier I mentioned we have the export service, which is one of our primary services. So every minute of every day, uh, we produce an, uh, an extract, a, a diff file. So what has happened in the previous minute? So we export this data of all the changes that are happening in OpenStreetMap, and we do that minutely, and we produce a, a joined up file, which is every hour, and then we join that up, and we produce a daily. So if you want to know that what has happened in the last minute, or the last hour, or the last day of OpenStreetMap, there are these files, and there are many, many servers, services that read in this data. We then also produce a weekly export of our data, and uncompressed, that's 580 gigabytes of data, which is, it's in the XML format, and if you're a programmer, that's, that's a scary amount of XML. You can't load that in Notepad. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
then only recently we've started, started offering what we call a full history extract of OpenStreetMap. And that's since the beginning of the project, or as far back as we can uh, realistically go, we export every single thing that has happened to OpenStreetMap. So someone's added a point of interest, and then they've removed the point of interest, and then they've added it back, and they've changed the name of that. We, we produce a weekly version of this file, and that is scary, scary big. 1.1 terabytes of data, which is insane amounts of data. But we produce that weekly, and it's available, and people can download it, download it from us or from one of the mirrors that we have. So all of this data, and specifically the export date service, uh, feeds into the rendering of the map. So this map that updates every minute, you can see why it's every minute now, because the, the diffs are produced every minute, and it feeds into the rendering so that people can see the map. So we use a uh, PostGIS database, which is different to the Postgres database that we use. So it's a specific type of database format. Uh, that runs in Postgres, just to confuse you. But uh, we then render that using a, a library called Mapnik, which was created sort of in union with OpenStreetMap. And then all of, all of that data is then rendered, turned into a beautiful map, or hopefully a beautiful map, using a thing called Carto CSS. And if you're a programmer or someone interested in how these maps are rendering, Andy Allen, the fellow sitting over there, is doing a talk at 4 o'clock in CR1, I believe, which is the furthest, this room, furthest room. It's the furthest room, and he's going to be doing a talk about how Carto CSS has developed over the last two years. He spent an amazing amount of time, and a whole lot of other contributors have spent time improving how OpenStreetMap has rendered and how other people have got involved in turning it in so that it's a more dynamic styling of the project and how we can blow up the scale and shrink the scale and do a whole lot of amazing things with that. So Andy's a great speaker. I highly recommend that you go see his talk. So we have all these, rend these two rendered servers that produce uh, minutely updates of the map, and we have thousands of requests being served every second. So what we do is we have 19 servers spread all over the world. Uh, as you can see on this map, there's all the lines congregate on certain points. So those, those are the locations that we have servers. So we have one in Taiwan, in Azerbaijan, in Northern Europe, in the UK, three different servers in the US, uh, yeah, and a number of locations in Europe. So we have servers that work as caching servers to speed up the map. When you access the map, you see you get sent to one of those servers. And we use uh, what's called GeoDNS to redirect you to one of those servers to make sure that the map is fast and available. So you all need a bit of a wake up. So people new to the project who don't really know us, how, how many staff do you think we have running all of this? Two? The answer was two potentially full-time staff running the project. Uh, the number's actually scarier than that. It, it's zero. We don't have any full-time staff running any aspect of the project. We're all volunteers. We all do, do this as a hop, hobby, but... <laughs> we're, we're, we're awesomely passionate about running it. And uh, we, we take great pride in being able to make a reliable service that people can base things like the humanitarian project on and get it running. And, and it's really great to be able to leverage OpenStreetMap to do all these amazing things. We have the foundation there. So we're not just a chaotic, chaotic group running this. We have the foundation for legal aspects of the project and the financial backing that we need. But mentioning the financials of the project, <laughs> we have to fund the project. And most of the, the hardware bought for the project is, comes via donate.openstreetmap.org. And we're launching a new donation drive that we're running uh, today, right now. <laughs> <laughs> 
uh, we're trying to raise a very modest fee uh, to fund the project for the next year, for the hardware for the project. It's a modest 56,000 uh, pounds, which on rough calculation is about $85,000. And uh, thanks to two very generous sponsors, Mapbox and MapZen, we are already halfway. So great, great thanks to them. We, we're halfway. We just need the help to get to the next bit. And I think we have a, a poster here <laughs> promoting the fi financial uh, the donation drive. So please tweet about it and get people involved. And if, if you're an organization that maybe has more backing, uh, go, go visit openstreetmap.org, uh, donate.openstreetmap.org, and we'll have information there on how organizations can, can help and support us. Thank you. Uh, so we have, sorry. So the, vo the volunteer team that I spoke about, uh, we've got Tom who spoke right before me. Uh, he does a fantastic job maintaining most of the code of the project, also working on the servers and making sure they run. We've got a guy called Matt. There's Andy Allen, who's going to be speaking later. We've got John Burgess and Sarah Hoffman and myself, who, who spend varying, varying levels making sure the project runs. Uh, we have a simple principle. If it can be automated, it needs to be automated. And we use a code management system called Git, uh, to store all our code and document the project. We also use Chef. Now, Chef is an automation system where you can set up servers in a particular way. So we have developers working on the code who work with us, uh, the operations team, or we one and the same in cases like uh, Tom, uh, who we write the Chef code that manages all these servers. And that allows us, for a team of five people, or three and, three and two halves, <laughs> To, to be able to, to run all of this project with limited time and resources. Uh, the chef code also then is documenting how to set up certain things and how, how certain services run. So it allows us to treat the entire project as code. So it's much easier to manage code than it is to, to manage individual servers and set up individual servers and install things. So we use chef for all the automation. Uh, we also have a simple principle that Everything that we can do publicly, we do publicly. So all of the chef code that we use for managing the servers, we have that in Git. And it's also on GitHub, which we recently pushed more of the things onto GitHub so that people can see it. Uh, we have planning tickets and operational things where we're planning certain servers and how we're going to do things. We have that all on GitHub so everyone here can look and see what we're doing. Uh, if you're interested, please jump in and take a look, see if you can contribute. We also then produce monthly ops change reports. So that's what we've changed in the project over the last few months, over the last month and previous months. So you can see what we're doing and how we're doing it, and hopefully contribute if you can. Uh, Andy Allen is talking on future, the future of OpenStreetMap, which is loosely guides how we as the op ops team work things. Because we might not know what the project is going to be doing in six times. They might uh, in six months' time, and we may have new new ideas. So we generally plan six months in advance, maximum of a year. Andy's talking about OpenStreetMap futures. I'm sure it'd be a very interesting talk. But we do have a few things that we're we're dealing with or have to deal with. So the growth of the project, as I said, is phenomenal. Uh, we have to continually invest new hardware to keep the project going and improve the software stack. Uh, so we, we continue to do that. We have, uh, we're have we making the, the website more secure and more of the services available under security. That's both for people mapping in part and places like the Middle East where they don't want to reveal that they're mapping certain things. And also, people are more security conscious these days thanks to the Snowden, Snowden stuff that has come out. And then also, over the next while, we're going to be upgrading the database cluster and part of the, the funding drive is to, to get the funds together to upgrade the, the database cluster that we have for the project. And that's where I hand over to you. Has anyone got any questions? Yeah. 
So the question was, how can volunteer developers help us? So uh, we have an IRC channel, which uh, I've listed in, in my links here. Uh, if you've got a particular bugbear about the project or something interesting, uh, either go ahead and start developing it or jump into the IRC channel and discuss it with us. Most of us are there during European business hours. Uh, we have the ticket, ticket systems and uh, uh, content repos, which you can do pull requests. Just go ahead and uh, have a go. Just get involved. Find, find some bugbear and try fix it. That's how most of us got involved. Uh, any more questions? Press your mic if you got one. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I went to a talk this morning called uh, the state map or something. Do you think the state system is the <laughs> So the question was, uh, are paid sysadmins coming to the project? It, it has been discussed many times before. I think we're reaching a point where uh, there def definitely need to be some more full-time people, or we need to distribute it amongst more people. And if there is a, anyone interested in getting involved with more of the ops side, please do. We'd love you to get involved. Uh, paid developers. Uh, there was a talk earlier this morning. Uh, the first talk about the fun, uh, Kate spoke about the uh, OpenStreetMap Foundation. She kind of hinted that the project has come to the point where we probably do need to hire people to do certain things or to get more things running at the same time. So I think it's inevitable at some stage. Yeah. When the big events happen, like say like uh, you know Typhoon Haiyan or or the Paul, what kind of like I mean that's several thousand mappers happening at one time, and we've also experienced sort of you know when we have big mapathons, we can have a couple hundred people in a room that will like look like denial of service attacks, I guess, on the <laughs> OSM API. Like, how can we sort of like work more closely with you guys to basically make that happen, I guess? Or what realistic strain is that actually putting on the API? So, so we do have things to protect us against denial of service attacks. So the question was, uh, you know, hot humanitarian events that possibly up to 200 people that join in one session, they're all mapping a, an area. That's a lot of people all at once. So far, our the project is running well. We can handle these sorts of things. We, we get uh, German TV occasionally has an article about OpenStreetMap or a news report. And that creates the biggest single traffic spikes that we have is when we appear on German TV. So at the moment, it's working really well. Obviously, we do, we do consider maintenance. As I mentioned, we've got those six servers that are handling most of the incoming requests. We, we try not to have maintenance on those when we know there's a big event coming up. But so far, we're handl handling it fairly well with those servers. We can handle two, 200 mappers, 300 mappers, all mapping at the same time. We've, we've got enough spare capacity, but that's because we've planned for that capacity. Uh, we are upgrading all those servers, and over, over time, as we get more, uh, we'll improve that. So yeah. It, it works well for the moment, <laughs> and we'll continue to plan for more people. Any more questions? Oh, one in the back. You pressed your button. Press your button in front of you, near the bottom of the mic. Yep. Yes. Uh, what is the uh, what is the latency for a uh, change by an editor to reach the site? You mentioned the minute update on the site for rendering. Uh, I imagine it's not all the workflows running. Can you uh, and where are they running? Can you enlighten us on that a little bit? So I didn't quite understand the question. Could, would you mind repeating it again? After an editor makes a change for yeah. validation and uh, generalization, all, all the other things that happen, uh, where do they happen and how long? should one expect for one change oh, to travel? OK, so I say I made a change right now. We have a slight little bit of delay for the replication to happen. And that's normally within 20 seconds, 15 seconds, the replication is 
done its task and we've got consistency over the databases. That's a maximum outlier. And then we have a process that runs every minute and produces those diff files. So within a minute and a half, that diff file should be out there or rounded up to the next minute, so two and a half minutes, three minutes. And then we have the rendering servers that import these changes and it pushes it into a queue to say it should be rendered. So our, our goal is for it to happen as almost immediately within that minute. But sometimes we have traffic spikes and when the map style changes, the queue, there's a queue that grows and it can grow up to half an hour to, to an hour to two hours when we really are under pressure. But that's queuing it, queuing the updates and they will happen. But most of the time, it's a flat line queue. There's no actual queue and it gets processed immediately. So within two minutes, the map is updated and you can see it. There's obviously caching layers involved in there and they, they have impacts, but the, the goal is for the map to update immediately within, and where I say immediately, I'm talking within two minutes of you making the change. Yeah. About 90% of the time, I would say it's, it makes it to the rendering database in 15 to 75 seconds and then under five minutes for all the caching worth, worst case. Yeah. So, so Paul is one of the guys that works on the performance of the rendering database quite a bit. So his numbers would be more accurate than anything I could, could do. Yeah. Any more questions? I think it's your last question. Ah, I was meant to do a plug. Uh, so we've got a hack day on Monday. Uh, it's not termed a hack day in the calendar. Uh, we're going to be talking about OpenStreetMap operations. There's going to be some presentations there. If you're a software developer or interested in how we run things or just interested generally, please come along. There's going to be talk of rendering, no doubt, and Wikipedia or the Wikimedia Foundation are really interested in doing uh, what's called, uh, what's the matter? A tile server or rendering using vector tiles. So if you're someone interested in that, please come along. They'd love to hear from you. Please share. Yuri is the magic person, the, t the two there. So, yeah, see you on Monday, hopefully. Wait, wait, wait. If you want to participate in the first version of Wikipedia Maps and decide which roads, which buildings, get included in the first version, if you want to play with the databases, features, or any, if you want to deal with um, map box vector tiles or some other stack, come talk to us. We, we need your help to get it out and running. Thank you. Cool. Cool. Thank, thank you, everyone.